So I'm Stephen Acosta, a member of the steering group for the CCAN Association. It was set up a couple of years ago conceptually to help govern this open source project for CCAN. So uh, there's a currently five members, Joel Natividad from OpenGov, Sebastian Molesky from Viterum, uh, Ashley Casavan from Canadian Government, and uh, currently Paul Walsh representing Open Knowledge, who sometimes tag teams with um, Adria who's in the tech team as well. So there's a good crossover at the moment between the tech team and the steering group. Speaking about the CCAN Association, obviously the, the project itself is driven by the community as every open source project is. And really the, the, the core of that is the technical team. So they meet every Tuesday and Thursday and um, they meet over Hangouts and um, they go through a set agenda to basically review pull requests, assign those to people. And just as recently as this morning, they're looking for more people in the tech team, they're looking for more resources to provide support to that effort. Um, part of today is about sort of getting everyone's ideas together for CCAM, but also getting everyone's commitments together at the end to say, how could we pull together as a group and say that we can help that core team? I think if we can think about that through today, then that would be fantastic. So. Open data is a public good um, because I'm talking to a group of people that probably know the conceptual basis of information goods as being transferable, non-right non -right restricted information goods especially create more value the more they're transferred, the more they're shared. And open data comes from that sort of principle. Um, particularly um, open, <laughs> open government and open data come from principles of participation, collaboration, and um, transparency. Whereas open source of participation, collaboration, openness, very, very similar. And we're talking about the same stuff here. When, if you were to do something internally as an organization, um, the cost of that thing to you needs to be sort of overweighed by the value that that thing is going to provide to you. And internally, if the cost is too high, you might be looking for an outsource provider or someone external who would be able to do it for a lower price. That's essentially the, the cost of transacting then is the differential between the two. Their cost plus the transaction cost becomes a measure against what you, your, your internal costs. So the way we collaborate is in, a, in that sort of market force way determined by that sort of relationship. If we can reduce the transaction cost enormously, then we get to see some really fantastic things happen. Um, the lowest form of transaction cost is basically a social contract. Um, you see peer-to-peer -peer, um, companies emerging now like Airbnb and Uber, which rely on social contracts to form the agreements between two parties to then provide and exchange services between each other. And government can do that with citizens in terms of private-public partnerships. Um, government can do that with corporations in terms of private-public partnerships and people within a community can do that as well. So if you're providing services to your community, there's, there's ways you can form social contracts. I think part of the big win with open data is how we turn it from not just um, you know, these entities, these endpoints, these sort of bits of information we want to turn insights into, but really make it part of the infrastructure for supporting society supporting civil society. And, you know, when we're looking at those sorts of problems within government, within private sector, within um, sectors generally, um, it's not always an IT problem we're trying to solve. There are usually other factors. And this diagram um, done a while back now by um, Dr. Rufus Pollock, so he illustrates that across one spectrum, certain types of problems are IT across the other axis, we're looking at you know, organizational change, um, governance. Within government, we're talking about, you know, there might be legislative and administrative acts that would have to be cha changed. There might be constitutional changes that would have to be required um, before you can solve some of these bigger problems. And, you know, looking at something like peer-to-peer -peer organizations or, or, or um, transactions forming within a community, something like Uber, we, we see examples of where traditional markets Taxi companies go to head to head with um, organizations like Uber, but they're fundamentally different types of ways of um, providing services. So um, these transformational changes within society, I think will occur no matter what. 
I think our job and our big win is to help support them however we can, because fundamentally, if you reduce those social transaction costs, you, you get a better win for everyone. Um, so back to CCAN. Um, how's it looking by the numbers? Um, you know, we've, we've got an active following on Twitter. We don't, we don't do that thing that I might do personally, where you follow someone and they follow you back and you, you get your numbers up. But basically, 7,500 uh, 7, people are following us on Twitter. There's active discussion there. Um, we've got hundreds of CCAM portals around the world that are um, live with thousands of data sets. I think um, 640 odd thousand data sets on the European data portal. Um, we've got about 150 contributors across the GitHub project. Um, Around, I think it's around 40 of those are generally active each year, and the sort of the type of activity of those contributors sort of varies over over time. But it's clear that we need more contributors that are more active more of the time to support call. Um, and we've got hundreds more that develop extensions. That so around CCAM because it's built with sort of like this core of an API, you can build so many different extensions talking directly to that API or extensions that basically modify the user experience slightly. Um, there's lots of different work going on in lots of different uh, repositories on GitHub. And we can all sort of draw on that experience and bring more of those people into core as well. Um, and within GitHub itself, there's 1,300 people following the CCAM project. So you know, how we, how we see 1,300 people following it down to about 40 people active, that's the sort of numbers we want to change. We want to change that proportion somewhat from a steering group perspective and tech team perspective. Just have to keep pausing. Um, so who counts on CCAN? I highlighted a couple of these before, but I've got a representative in the group from DataGovAU, 23,200 data sets thereabouts. We won't talk about the PDFs, that's a recent thing, but it's all good stuff, and um, you know, a, a big chunk of those data sets are machine readable. The endpoints you can you can delve directly into through data store. Um, the humanitarian data exchange has got some awesome capability that's been baked into it. They've been doing heaps of work with data with visualization around maps and all sorts of things. That's a great portal. DataGov obviously is a pretty foundational platform that's based on CCAN uh, in the US. Uh, the Canadian government is also using CCAN and extending it fairly fairly well to meet their um, administrative bureaucratic requirements around collecting information from agencies and provinces and throughout Canada. And they also solve the problem of um, having a bilingual French-English uh, CCAN portal. So they put a lot of work into that as well. And the European Data Portal as an aggregator of metadata across all the European members, member countries um, has over 640,000 data sets. And uh, coming out of CCANCON in Madrid, uh, one of the good pieces of news is they're going to open spec the requirements that they're putting out there for making CCAN more robust at that volume as a catalog. So that would be good. I mean, at that sort of volume, anything you do, consider it a, like a cron job, would take some time. Any sort of manipulation you might want to do to add add um, additional field values to metadata or whatever it might be. And getting to those upper limits is what we want to be able to do. We want to be able to have global repositories, if you will, that can have all the data. So why? Um, in fact, I didn't explain this. This presentation is broken down to the why, the how, and the what. So, why use CCAN? Well, it's used by a lot of people around the world. It's open source. Um, it's got a large and expanding installation base. And it's not just an installation base within a particular sector. It's expanding into different sectors with private sector users, academic users, and even um, you know, community-based projects like uh, New York BC, or the, the, the New York Beta, Beta New York. Um, Project that John Latipadad is involved in, um, they build their own community data portal, and that sort of community effort is, uh, you know, uniquely paired with an open source project and works really well. Uh, it's a Python web app, Postgres database, um, and I often say this: its user group is basically machines, custodians, then end users. So 
if you're building an application on top of, of CCAM, it's really good because you're kind of then its primary user. Um, if you need to do data custodianship and governance and provenance around data, um, then it's really good because you're pretty much the secondary user. If you're an end user for discoverability, then it's quite good because it's got Apache Solar. But if you start getting into the, the, the sort of like the, the fourth type of user, it would be those who need to generate insights from CCAM, those who need to generate, you know, um, clearer ideas on discovering data records within the data sets themselves. Um, then we're looking at other things that might be sitting outside of CCAM or might be um, baked into CCAM through extensions. Um, and I, I think through the rest of today, we'll talk more and more about that. So how does it operate? I've actually talked a bit about this already, and um, it, open, it operates on principles of openness, collaboration, participation, has open source. I can let it go without the... Um, the governance structure, as I mentioned, there's a steering group. Uh, there's the idea that there's an advisory group as well. So the CCAN membership, whether you're at the gold, silver, or bronze level, um, at the, I'm pretty sure it's at the gold level, gives you access to the advisory group. As CCAN grows and we get more sponsored members, um, so imagine you know, large IT companies that have an overlapping interest with open data investing in CCAN over the longer term, um, they would become part of the advisory group and have a bit of a voice to influence the roadmap, influence the sort of user stories that are being um, met within the technical roadmap. The steering group is a governance structure that um, over time will then have beneath it domain specific working groups. So you can imagine a domain specific working group for CCAN and linked data or academic data or data that climbs on rocks, you know, all sorts. Um, the technical group is pretty much the core and the, the, cent the central part of it. And there's a communications and out outreach group, which is pretty much me at the moment. What it manifests as is things like this, um, banners being printed, some brochures that are out the front there, which you can grab and distribute amongst your friends. Um, and then below that, the concept of members is any contributing member, anyone who's working on the code base is sort of like by proxy sort of brought in. Um, but we're looking at ways to have a more of an accredited membership. So those who are actually uh, contributing to core, we can then, you know, put them into a, into a special status as um, associate members. Those from an organizational perspective that are contributing core can get in-kind status and then go up the tiers from gold, silver to, from bronze, silver to gold, membership in the association. Um, and the rule of thumb is basically if, you, if, you, if you're in-kind putting in around two FTE, then you get into, them, into that sort of gold status. Um, we're looking for ways to get more full-time people working in the CCAN core team. So any ideas would be fantastic from today. Where to get community help, um, Stack Overflow, the dev mailing list, uh, there's Roadmap on Waffle. Um, there'll be work getting put into that. And I've mentioned earlier the tech team, where to get professional help. Uh, there's three companies. I won't say the first one because I've sworn there's a $5 penalty if I do. OpenGov is a US-based, very large company that has a lot of services that they can provide, and CCAN is a new addition to their uh, fleet of products. Um, and Viterum is the open knowledge spin-off that's um, started earlier this year. And um, you know they're, they're picking up good work and they're, they're investing in CCAN. They're just sort of coming on board now and starting to invest more and more heavily. Um, and you know, the good thing is we have a really strong relationship with these three companies, uh, the people who are sort of heading them up and, and running this, the direction of these companies are all talking together. Um, I'm meeting with uh, Joel and Sebastian um, next week at Code for America, so that's all fantastic. Um, and this, these are the membership tiers I was talking about, gold, silver, bronze, and then support a member is that idea that if you're a contributor in GitHub, you're gonna get that status. Now we get to the what. Now, for those following at home and for those in the room, this might be pretty obvious. It's open source, it's on GitHub, so you can obviously just look at the code base. The API is all documented and available. You can read through that and find out how it actually works. Um, 
its structure is based around the governance of data. So kind of like a CRUD application, basically create organizations, under organizations create data sets, under data sets create resources, and all of that is readable via API and doable via API as well, importantly. So you can have other machines, rather imagine a, um, a mobile app or a, or a WordPress or Drupal website where you can create data sets on the fly in a jurisdictional portal because you have a use case for that. Um, and then at the platform level, you have a platform custodian. And within the organizations, you have administrative privileges by default around being a, either an admin custodian type at the organization level, an editor, or a member. And so the idea there is, as a member, you can generally see private data sets. As an editor, you can create data sets. As a custodian, you can create users for the other organization and do all the other things cascading down. And generally, out of the box, you either have published or private data sets. Um, looking forward, uh, private data sets historically haven't been discoverable via Apache Solar. So if you kind of browse in, you kind of say, where are my data sets? You have to go through the organization's path. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's 2.6. Uh, those will be exposed through Solar now. So that'll be for authenticated users with the right access. <laughs> so that'll be a handy update for those thinking about going to 2.6. Um, the data publishing workflow is pretty simple. Like uh, you create an organization, you log in as a member of that organization with the right privilege, you click add data set. It's, it's pretty basic, you go through three steps. Add the basic information about your data set, um, including any metadata, and if you've extended your portal, then there's a whole range of metadata you might be requiring your custodians to put in. Then you add resources, and that could really be anything. It could be an Excel file, it could be a PDF document, it could be a um, uh, hyperlink to a different endpoint on a completely different system. Um, and recently, we released there was released by a company, um, you know, like a GitHub extension, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so the idea is you can reference code plus data together within one data set. Um, the user interface. So user registration is supportable. You can have a portal, which essentially is, um, as I was saying earlier, that could be supporting a community-based crowdsourcing sort of endeavor, where people self-register, elect them to create data sets and upload resources. Um, user management is available from those administrator-type users, custodian-type users. Um, custodian workflows to manage data sets and manage resources, that's inclusive of things like harvesters, so you can set up harvesters as a custodian. Um, the directory browse by organization or group, the groups are uh, a logical grouping so that you can have things like communications, transport across a broad set of organizations, and those data sets can be aggregated into those groups. Um, on top of things like keyword tagging. And faceted search um, kind of comes out of the box at the moment, but uh, in, a, in future versions, uh, Apache Solar won't be baked into CCAM by default. Um, it will be something that you add in by extension or configuration. Um, and that's just to make it a simpler install for people. A lot of people have been having some hassles getting Solar stood up, as well as all the other things you have to get stood up in terms of dependencies. Um, and I think, in fact, just sort of coming back to that, what we need to remember, even though um, there's sort of like a whole bunch of enterprise users here, um, we want this to remain an open source project. We want this to remain accessible to anyone who can basically install it on their desktop, on their laptop, and get it going so that they can then very quickly get to the stage of customizing it, getting involved in the code base if they will. Um, resource views to preview the data. So that, that came in at version two, uh, 5.3. Uh, and the concept there is that for any one of those resources underneath data sets, you can create a view for that by type. Um, so if you have an XLS file for Microsoft, you might have a Microsoft viewer for that. If you have a CSV, you might use the default recline.js view for that, or you might build something a bit sexier. Um, and for all sorts of things, the uh, GitHub one that I mentioned, we built a resource view for that, and the idea is to make that kind of cool, so you get the same sorts of dashboarding um, capability from github.com within a resource view on CCAN portals, which would be cool. Um, 
and metadata view. So obviously you can see the metadata at that data set level about your um, data sets. Now the CCAN API, everything you can do via the um, user interface plus more. Um, get the full catalog, traverse the entire catalog, um, drill down just at the top layer or all the way down into the resource layer, all the way into records if you're going via the data store API um, for those that can be ingested like CSV files. Um, and within that other stuff, so uh, you get all the package information, uh, just a, a particular ID for a data set and then just, just get the resources if you want to be searching, then you can use the inbuilt search to say, I just want to get CSV files, for example, or I just want to get stuff that's tagged with the word cloud. Um, and obviously, you can create, update, delete uh, resources and other objects, which from a machine point of view, if you're building applications, is extremely important. And the activity stream allows you to do some neat things around notifications. So um, for a number of projects, um, it's not as often used, um, particularly for sort of government jurisdictional ones, because, mostly because they don't necessarily allow the general public to register. Um, but for community projects, it's much more usable because once you self-register, then you can start to collect and follow data sets. Or for internal users within an organization, if you're gonna be using that feature, it can be quite handy um, to have that sort of feature um, connect internal users or users of the platform with the concept of collaborating around data sets. You have to first make them, the changes and these things discoverable. Um, and that's it, that's pretty much my presentation as a walkthrough where CCAN's 